Hey everyone, Larry and Grayson here from Erlbacher Gear. Welcome to our very first virtual shop tour. Thanks for taking time out of your day to join us. We've really missed everyone at our crank in this year. Um, the shop tour is always a favorite part of that, at least it is for us. It's a lot of fun for the guys that actually make the machines to get to meet the people who knit on them. As most of you guys know, or some of you guys know, we are primarily a gear house. We make sprockets too. Uh, this is a series of gears that we're making. These are spur plate gears. These are going to go on welding positioners. Uh, this is, as I always make it a joke, that the gear people don't know about the knitters and the knitters don't know about the gear people, but now I guess that has changed. <laughs> These gears weigh, I don't know, probably about 3,000 pounds together. Uh, we have the capacity to cut up to 90 inches in diameter. We used to do a lot of smaller gears for the race car industry, but we've gradually gotten larger and larger. Uh, the gear work is much different than the knitting work in the fact that it only takes three people. We, uh, this is actually Trenton. He's one of our interns. He is in the second stage, actually. We're not completely in order. He is... Um, fastening the plate to the machine to do some drilling and tapping. This is Cliff. This is the first stage of gear production. These blanks come in just like that. He's going to load it into the machine. He's going to turn it, face it, do some bore work, and then it'll go on to Trenton. And in just a minute, we'll see where it goes on the gear hopper. Now Rick has the gear getting ready to go on the hopper. This particular machine happens to be a British machine and it has the capacity to do up to 90 inches. This is our largest gear machine. Once the gear is indicated, what you're seeing is the gold tool, which is the hob. This is a climbing hob. It starts from the bottom of the, the part and climbs to the top. You're actually seeing two gears stacked on top of each other. The tool is what decides the geometry of the teeth, and then there is a gearbox in the back of the machine that decides how many teeth the gear will have. Once they're completed, they go on the truck and go for delivery. Now on to the knitting stuff. The first machine you'll see as you walk in the shop is our saw and we usually order our material in 12 foot lengths and cut it up into smaller pieces just like this. This is the ring that gets welded onto the base as you'll see here in just a minute. Here is a, the first set of bases to be run this week. We used to do that out of a full piece of thickness of material and realized that that was way too much mill work so we decided it was easier to weld the, the ring on and then do the machining for the camshell and the cylinder fit. The bases are the most time intensive part of the knitting machine. Uh, at this point it still has several stages to go through before it's completed. This is our new deburr machine and basically what happens when parts are machined when they come out uh, they have some sharp edges and they probably have a little bit of a burr on them and normally we would have to sit and uh, use a, some type of a tool to deburr but uh, with a little deburr machine we can throw the part in this ceramic media will tumble the part and it just kind of it's an abrasive and it will uh, knock off all those sharp edges and it'll take the burrs off and it saves uh, a lot of man hours. We can throw this in here uh, for an hour and a half or so and uh, they come out deburred and no sharp edges. So here are river dial blanks. We buy these in a 12 foot long piece of solid aluminum bar. They get cut up on the saw they go back to the lathe they get the front side turned and then the back side we turn all 144 on one side and then flip them over and do all 144 on the second side 144 is because that's what we get out of a 12 foot bar
This is Erin. She's a second year intern with us, and she is loading the blank on the fourth axis. And what her this process is, is she's got to drill and tap the holes that the river driver goes in. Once the drilling and tapping is complete, it's loaded back on the fourth axis and it's cutting the slots in the river dial. This is a 230 tooth jeweler's saw and it cuts straight across. This is why you can't have a river dial that has an uneven amount of slots. As you can see, it rotates each time, it re-indexes and it cuts straight across. We can cut about 650 river dials with one saw blade. And I believe Aaron told me that that uh, is about a 12 to 15 minute cycle for each part. So if you're doing 144 of them off of uh, one rod of aluminum, that's a lot of time. And that's just for the slotting. Moving on from river dials, we thought we would stay with Aaron and her mill with the fourth axis just so you could see it see her machine another part. Um, this is a part that we buy in tubing instead of a solid round stock. We used to make these parts one at a time out of flat bar and decided that it's much more efficient to make, that, make it out of the piece of tubing. This is actually how we make spring extenders and we make them in the round and then cut them apart um, if she can get the, the part out of the machine. That's a tight tolerance there. You got to cut her some slack on that. Come on, Aaron. There you go. It's often confused with a camshell, but it's actually spring extenders. And we can get five spring extenders off of each ring. And we should add that she's just drilling and tapping the holes here. There's a lot more to making this part than what she's doing here today. This is Daryl, and everybody knows Daryl. And what Daryl is doing is getting parts picked to go to Rick for powder coat for the build this week. It looks like Rick was probably deburring these bases here, getting them ready to go into the wash tank. He's also putting together a few heel fork weights here. And some stem weights for you. This is Brandon. Brandon is one of our newer employees, only been with us about four or five months. And what he is doing is cutting up the spring extenders that Aaron just finished on her mill. Um, each one gets several cuts to give them the right dimensions to go on the machine. And this is Cole, yet another one of our interns. Uh, we're lucky to have these guys, we appreciate them. And he's working on cylinders. So as you can see, here's uh, blank cylinders. And he's gonna load them up into the old Akuma lathe here. And right now he's just running one side of them. When he gets all of these ran, he'll flip them over and reprogram the machine and uh, take that other little lip off of there. Let's check in with Brandon again here. He's tapping part of the crank handle 
and he's tapping the part that the little nylon screw goes into that keeps the tension on your crank handle. And this is Carrie. Some of you guys may have met him if you've been to one of our crank ins. He is working on river arms. We buy these, they when we buy them, they have been plasma cut out of a sheet. As you'll see there uh, on a close-up shot, we'll show you the before and after of what he's doing. The river arms take quite a bit of stages for them from start to finish. So what he's done is he's just machined the surface off done the engraving and then there's still several stages as we'll walk you through here. Here's another example of a part that we do out of square tubing. This is the river arm holder. That's the first step of it. It starts as a solid piece of, of, of square of rectangular bar the first stage and then the second stage. Carrie does both does this part on the mill as well. Here's the tappet plate. It starts off as a block of aluminum. Then it has the first the first side and then onto the second side. This is uh, one of the more time intensive parts on the machine as well because once we're done doing the machining then it still has to get all the pieces put on it. So it's still not ready, but it's ready to be assembled. So when Carrie finishes with the first stage of the river arm, they come back over here to our welding intern, Ethan, and he's going to put another little part on them. I don't know if you've noticed this fixturing that he's using. Our guys actually built that here, and what it does is it holds those parts in the same place every time so as they're being welded it uh, provides for a uniform part. So after Ethan is done with it, it goes back to carry back on the mill, and you can see the left has, has just got the piece welded on, and the right has had the um, radius put on both the side arm and the bottom. And that is a ready-to-go river arm. After these small parts are built, they come back up here to Rick where they wait to be powder coated. Normally this rack has a lot more parts in it, but we do have a pretty large build this week. You can see a lot of these parts have our standard colors on them, and they're actually ready to go right on a machine. We've been doing custom colors now for a few years. And here's a sampling of some of the custom colors that we've done in the past. Before we can powder coat, Rick has to make sure each part is washed in a special detergent that removes any excess of coolant or uh, any type of oil from the metal it would cause the paint not to stick. So 
So Rick's just pulled this rack of parts out of the oven. They've been preheated to 400 degrees. And 400 degrees is the temperature that uh, the paint cures at. Powder coating is done by an electrostatic charge. When the powder comes out of the end of the gun, it uh, is attracted to the metal and that static charge will pull all the little powder particles right into any little nooks and crannies on the metal. When we were talking about custom colors earlier, you're only really limited on a custom color by the one part paint. Um, there are several different kinds of finishes that require two passes and what we found out if you put two passes of paint on it um, the powder coating so thick that you have to do a lot of extra machining in order to make make the knitter work so we do limit um, our custom colors to the one part color if you ever had any questions about that you could talk to Kim or Grayson about it when you when you place an order. Now that he's finished the powder coating, he is ready to put the parts into the oven. I don't know if you could tell or not, but those parts are already starting to look shiny due to them already being preheated. So here's his 400 degree oven, and he's just going to roll his parts in. Now all he has to do is set his high-tech timer here and we'll check on his parts in about 50 minutes. And after the timer goes off, the parts are rolled back out of the oven, still in the rack, and we let them air cool. Now once these bases and handles are cooled, they'll go right back to assembly. Here we have the assembly process. This is Daryl. looks like he's picked his parts for three machines to build. We usually build between six and nine a week. We have a meeting on Monday, decide what colors, if there's any custom colors that Rick needs to have powder coated by Thursday for Daryl to pick parts, and then we build on Friday. After the machines are assembled and tested, then this is the ship rack. Um, as you can see, we've got a couple of custom colors this week. Once the folders are placed on the machine that tells us that the shipping labels are ready, the machine is paid for, and the invoices are in the folders ready to go. Here's a machine that's been tested and boxed and ready to go. However, they noticed that there was a blemish on the mast, so it has to go back to Rick to be repowder coated, and then once that's done, this machine will be boxed up and shipped to its new home. And here's a couple more machines ready to go to their new home. And here is Kim's office. This is also where we did the live uh, video for the virtual crank in. If you call, this is where she will be talking to you from. Here's a few random odds and ends machines that we have. We've got a couple custom colors. And then we also have Kim's Franken machine, which basically was extra pieces and parts that got painted. There's a army green one. 
Um, just some various machines that we have. If anybody has a problem, we try to duplicate it as we're talking to them or FaceTiming with them so we can come up with a solution for them. Here is the table that we do all the testing on. So on Fridays, this will be lined up with between six and nine machines ready to test. And speaking of Kim, here she is. Kim does the majority of our sales. She does order entry. She does the website. She does a lot with you knitters. So when you call, she's the girl you want to talk to. And just a quick side note, this, what we're showing you today is just what is happening in our shop this week. If you came next week, it would be a whole different series of parts. Um, so we just wanted to give you just kind of a, a snapshot of what's happening this week, just so you guys understand what, what it takes to make these machines. As the tour draws to an end, we want to take this time to thank a few people. First off, we have to thank Jim and Amy Grant at Good Karma Farms for putting this all together. We know how hard it is to put on a regular crank in, and I can't imagine how hard it was to, to do that with all this technology involved. Second, I'd like to thank all the guys at Erlbacher Gear. These guys really put blood, sweat, and tears into these little sock knitting machines, and... Uh, they have really missed getting to visit with you guys face to face at our crank in this year. And last but not least, we would like to thank our customers and the knitting community as a whole. We can't do what we do without you. So, on behalf of our office staff, which includes Miss Linda and Miss Grayson, as well as two of the laziest employees of Erlbacher Gear, Atticus and Molly. <laughs> and I'm Larry. Thanks for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the virtual crank-in.